Hi, we're here in Denton, Texas at the University of North Texas with Dom Little, who's the professor of tuba here at UNT. Thanks so much for coming in, Dom. You're welcome. I've been looking forward to it. You've been at uh, University of North Texas for since the 1970s, I think you were done. Yeah, this is my 38th fall here at UNT, and then I had three years at the University of Northern Iowa. So it's my 41st year of college teaching. Congratulations. Thank you. That's wonderful. Um, and while you were uh, um, in Northern Iowa, you had opportunities, and you were also in school at Northwestern, so you had opportunities to study with uh, Mr. Jacobs. Well, my very first lesson with Mr. Jacobs was in December of 1969. I was a senior at Peabody in Baltimore, mm -hmm. and our wind ensemble came out and gave a concert at Midwest like people do. Yeah. And uh, it was a great experience, but probably the thing that's most memorable to me was getting my first lesson with Arnold Jacobs. And everybody, you know, wanted to take a lesson with him during Midwest time. And he said he didn't have time for me. Well, one of my tuba friends, Rich Nahotsky, in the wind sure. ensemble, called up Jacobs and tried every means of persuasion that he could think of. And Jacobs says, oh, bring him down. And uh, they squeezed me in for a lesson, and I, I was really grateful. It was down in the basement of uh, 8839 South Normal Avenue. Uh -huh. And uh, I was astounded just to kind of walk down those back steps from the kitchen and through to where I had to get to to get to the little spot. It was almost like a cockpit in a plane. There was so much stuff there, wires and uh, electronic equipment and instruments and old string bass in the corner. Uh, and you know, a few uh, cases of beer sitting off in the corner. Okay. What, uh, um, would you remember that first lesson? You know, I remember being there. I remember him giving me what was probably an introductory lesson. I was from the East Coast. Mm -hmm. uh, also, I, I had never had a lesson from a tuba player before when I was a senior in college. Wow. I studied with John Mellick, who was principal trombone of the Baltimore Symphony, and John taught two or three of us who were tuba players, uh, Rich Nahotsky and mm -hmm. myself, and uh, he was a wonderful musician. He taught us a lot about orchestral style, worked us through the entire Arben book and all three books of uh, Bordoni, and uh, we loved him, but I just hadn't had a lesson for a tuba player. So like a lot of kids in the 60s, I heard these great Reiner recordings of Jacobs playing with the Chicago Symphony. And so, you know, I was dying to have a lesson with him and a lesson with a real tuba player. And, and he was what we considered the best. So I don't really remember details of the lessons except for the kind of things that he did. He, you know, if I asked a question about embouchure, he would talk about it like he usually did, which was to say this is not the most important thing in the world. He'd, he'd put the mouthpiece on or a visualizer, and he'd play way off to one side, way off to the other side, up to the top and down the bottom. It would all sound great. It would all sound the same. And he was basically saying, don't worry about your embouchure. Talked a little bit about breathing. He played the tuba, played my tuba. Uh, worked on a little bit of, I guess, whatever solos I might have had with me at that time. And I just remember it uh, just being a great experience and I was in awe the whole time. Did you, uh, do you uh, recall the sound that you heard from him? Was that something that, uh, that uh, was there a, a strong memory of that? I feel like I can still hear it in my ear. And also at that Midwest convention, before we left, he came down and tried out some tubas. And I can almost play a little video in my mind of him kind of walking in. Oh God, that's Arnold Jacobs. It's Arnold Jacobs. And he came over and sat down and he had a couple of mouthpieces in his pocket and a visualizer in his pocket. He was just slightly rumpled. You know, when he took a breath, like one of his buttons of his white shirt would sort of open up a little bit and he'd button it back up. Mm -hmm. But I remember he picked up the tuba and did one of his warm-ups and like everybody from within about 100 feet around 
that booth, I don't know what booth it was, it was a tuba booth, it was just kind of like dead silence and it froze and then he played the most amazing warm-up you, you could imagine. Wow. Now tell me about the time, you, uh, you were at Northwestern from, in the 1970s, you got your master's there? Yeah, so I, well, you know, I went back to Peabody and this was my last semester mm -hmm. and I applied to two schools for graduate school. I applied to uh, Temple with, uh, to study with A. Torchinsky mm -hmm. and I s applied to Northwestern and, I, and I, I never went out there to audition. I told Northwestern that I had a lesson with uh, Mr. Jacobs and for them to contact him, which is what he told me to do over the phone and uh, that he would give a little uh, reference for me and admit me. Uh, you know, as a graduate to the student. Mm -hmm. So finally I got a letter saying that uh, I was accepted to Northwestern and there was some scholarship help. And I got the same thing from uh, Temple with Abe Torchinsky and it actually was a really tough choice. I, I, I think I would have been fine to have gone to either place. Uh, I enjoyed a visit with Torchinsky mm -hmm. up at Temple and played for him and I liked him. And I think the thing that pushed me towards Northwestern was a combination of the, the aura of the famousness of Jacobs, sort of combined with the fact that I had grown up on the East Coast and South Jersey and I was familiar with Philadelphia. And really, I, I don't think I'd ever been west of State College, Pennsylvania at the age of 22. So I, I was wanting to uh, go out and explore new horizons, so my decision was made to go out to Northwestern and study with Jacobs, and I drove out after Labor Day of uh, 1970, enrolled at Northwestern, and started my lessons the next week. So I had weekly lessons with him for my master's degree at Northwestern, which in those days, as you probably know, was three quarters. Mm -hmm. So I was in and after Labor Day and I was out with a degree before the first of July. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually I stayed on a couple more years in Chicago and uh, eventually got into Civic. And I had a, uh, maybe they still do it today, but I had a Civic scholarship to continue study with Jacobs. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, with those lessons, those were primarily geared towards uh, orchestral excerpts. And uh, we had two tuba players who were accepted to Civic that year who alternated. Bob Rada, uh, spelled R-A-D-A, mm -hmm. but he pronounced it Rada, and Bob and I uh, kind of enjoyed sharing it together. And uh, we would come down there mostly on Friday mornings before Mr. Jacobs had a Friday afternoon basically student concert mm -hmm. and he would really work us hard and run us through whatever it was that he had to play that Friday afternoon. Mm -hmm. So he would spend close to two hours with the two of us. Sometimes we would have lunch together uh, and then we would get to hear it that afternoon. Right. And he also let us take his parts with his markings and go up and copy them. Uh, you had asked me uh, remembrances of uh, things that I may have learned in lessons and well uh, I would say that I probably think of little things that I learned from him or things for le from lessons whether they were uh, civic uh, orchestral section lessons or the lessons at, in his basement of his old home on Normal Avenue or a few lessons I had later on uh, downtown Chicago. I probably think about them every single day now mm -hmm. for you know 40 some years. But uh, so his influence was you know really tremendous. But I've never been asked to really recount anything about it and I've never really written about it. Uh, I've never really gone out and tried to do any types of clinics or master classes uh, on Jacob's themes because I don't feel qualified. But there are some things in particular that were huge influences on me and one was uh, the vocal side of the tuba. Mm -hmm. And I, I've always been an amateur vocalist and I'll, I'll use the word amateur. I've taken voice lessons uh, from maybe four or five voice teachers since the time I was in Peabody. 
uh, up through actually my years uh, teaching at the University of Northern Iowa. And it, it was just a fun thing that I did. I sang mm -hmm. as a paid chorister in choirs. I did it at the Northwestern University Chapel mm -hmm. under Greek Fountain. Sure. And yeah. sang at the Baha'i House of Worship up there in Wilmette mm -hmm. as a paid chorister. And, oh, I was a founding member of the Bach Society of Denton when I came here as a young faculty member before I had a lot of tuba gigs. But going back to when I studied with Jacobs, he really encouraged that. And uh, he told me a story about the time that he was in Curtis, which surely must be documented, uh, about him uh, on the spur of the moment singing the bass solos from Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Mm. Have you heard that? I've not heard of uh, Str some Stravinsky uh, opportunities, uh, but not the Beethoven. No. Well, what he told me was, the best I can remember it, was that uh, Curtis was doing a production of Beethoven's Ninth, and he was studying voice a little bit, but right. as a secondary, not as his primary right. focus. And he said that the bass soloist got sick before mm -hmm. the performance of Beethoven's Ninth, and they didn't know what they were going to do, and somebody told them that they thought Arnold Jacobs could sing them, so actually he went in. Uh, maybe on just a dress rehearsal and sang the bass solos for Beethoven's Ninth, and he said uh, he got really good response from the Curtis voice faculty, and they came to him and asked him if he would change his major wow. from tuba to voice, and he said, oh no, I'm a tuba player. You, you can imagine how he That's would say that. Yeah. But I always enjoyed hearing that story, and uh, I appreciated the encouragement that he gave me to sing, which I, yeah. I think has been helpful in my playing mm -hmm, absolutely, and, absolutely. and in my lessons over the years. Would you say that, that um, is that one of the primary uh, aspects of his teaching that you've, that you've carried through into your pedagogy, into your, to your teaching, to the, the singing style? Yeah, I, I, I would say that's one thing. And of course there's a lot of other things that, you know, just the way I read his philosophy changed over the years a little bit from the time I was a student till the time I would hear master classes and clinics and do reading years later and it felt like that uh, as he aged and continued to teach and retired from the Chicago Symphony that he became even more of himself in the sense that he taught more music, uh, more concept, uh, more of the mental concept of playing the tuba and less even about breathing. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's famous for teaching breathing, but I felt like that he talked about breathing more <coughs> in uh, useful generalities mm -hmm. and maybe less in specifics. And, you know, people may not agree with this, but this is just kind of my uh, take of it, and I felt like that that's kind of the direction that I went with my teaching over the years that I really did a lot less with how to breathe and mm -hmm. more with doing it in a very general, natural way and uh, spending more time with helping my students plan where to breathe as it fits the music and as it fits their physical abilities. Right. So it's different for everybody. I would have to agree, based upon this project thus far, the, the reactions I'm getting from those of whom who studied with him for a couple or three decades, ending in the 90s, that their observation is that he began to get, he began to go from the wind and song to the song and wind. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, he was always about the song, but he, I think he started to, to feel that maybe his legacy was going to be more about the wind and less about the song. And to him, the song was always the most important thing. I think you would, you would probably agree yeah, with that. Yeah, I think that makes total sense from my experience that was kind of intense in those yeah. years at Northwestern. And, and then, of course, the other influence that's really obvious that I hasn't, haven't mentioned was you know, probably the hundreds of concerts that I heard live with the Chicago Symphony uh, you know, downtown, and, and as well as some up at Ravinia during mm -hmm. those years. And I continued to come back uh, during my years at the University of Northern Iowa. And 
you know, I, I heard the Fort Worth Symphony play the Tchaikovsky Fifth um, last Saturday night. They did kind of a Russian festival, and my colleague, uh, Ed Jones, mm -hmm. who was a mm -hmm. former student and a close friend, uh, succeeded me in the Fort Worth Symphony, and he did a great job. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as I would hear that piece, the, the, the things that I could hear that weren't there, I, I could hear Herseff, the way that he played those principal trumpet parts, I could hear all those parts the way Jacobs played it, and of course I could hear the way Clevenger played the horn solo. Right. And I still enjoyed the way I heard it in Fort Worth, but boy, I could just hear it in my head, and you know, at the same time I'm listening to them. So I would say, you know, having heard him live so many times was really profound, and it helped me so much during the 21 years that I played at Fort Worth Symphony to just have concepts of uh, these pieces. Yeah, so, so conceptually having that, uh, that in, your, in your mind, that the tuba in the mind is the source material for the tuba in the hands. It really helped me a lot. It helped me to get along as far as I could, and I, I, I played tuba about 50 years and I've played professionally about 45, and uh, just about one year ago, as I was getting ready to turn 65, I decided it was time to let go of my last position with the Dallas Opera, and so I ended the way that I began uh, playing in the banda oh. on uh, Aida. How about that? And uh, it, it was a nice way to oh. go there. That sounds great. Thank you so much for having uh, us come in and and uh, talk to you about Mr. Jacobs and uh, uh, Puddles. We just flew in from Eugene, and so Puddles is in the car resting. Even though it's 100 degrees out there, he's really liking the heat. But before we left the car, he did instruct me to present you with our thanks. This lovely uh, University of Oregon, genuine University of Oregon glass. And it's Mighty Oregon. There you okay. go. We hope you'll uh, use it uh, uh, in good health. Thanks a lot, Mike. I enjoyed it. Likewise, Tom. Thanks so much. I hope there's something there that's even slightly useful to you. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. And now back to you. Now, now, Don, here's a here's a really great picture. I've seen this around before, but it's I've seen it in your uh, in your studio here on the wall, and it's of Mr. Jacobs playing a. A really great looking tube, and it looks like it's in Lutkin Hall at Northwestern, it so it's probably a master class. Yeah. Then I noticed that uh, this tuba right next to you looks very similar to the yeah. tuba in the picture. Yeah. What, uh, what can you tell me about this? This is basically uh, a Holton copy of a York. Uh, it never really had its birth as a B flat tuba, except that Jacobs told me that. Holton owned some of the mandrels and tooling that belonged to York and that this huge series of B-flat tubas that they produced in the 50s and 60s that kind of looked like this, gener that generally didn't have a fifth valve, were all made in that York style. And then in the uh, early 60s there were some older craftsmen there who kind of knew how to improvise a C-tuba from the B-flat tooling and to come out with a C tuba without it ever having been B flat. Mm -hmm. I probably haven't described that very well, but no, that's, it makes perfect that's sense. the best I can no, remember it. And they really only made a few that had the original fifth valve. Mm -hmm. Well, Jacobs had one that was like a, a brother to this in his studio, and we'd see it sitting there, and every now and then he would pick it up, and uh, he told me that it had slightly more fundamental to it than his York, and so that if he had to play like uh, orchestral arrangements of the Ring Cycle or De Valkyrie or things like that, that he would bring that Holton in and play it for those tunes instead of the York because mm -hmm. the low register came out a little bit better. So I was really intrigued by that too. But And one time I was down for a Friday morning lesson uh, and Jacob says to me, Don, I've got to take this Holton up to uh, Orchestra Hall. Would, do you think you could drive me up and help me carry it in? 
And oh my God, of course. You know, I mean, this was like carrying the, the, the king's mm -hmm. sepulchre or whatever. And sure, I did that. And so we drove downtown. I think I was driving a, a 67 Chevelle or something like that. And uh, we put the uh, Holton that was the brother of this in the back seat. We parked in the underground. Mm -hmm. And I carried it up. And it didn't feel very heavy or big to me because I was about 23. And I remember we're walking in and he says, Don, when you get to be my age, you're really going to hate lugging these things around. And he kind of laughed. And I kind of laughed too because, you know, it didn't seem to be a big deal. But man, he was right. <laughs> <laughs> At this age, it really is an effort to carry it around. Well, to take the story a little bit further, um, about a year later, uh, Ron Munson was the original owner of this tuba. Ron played this wow. in the Marine Band in Washington, D.C. during his stint. And then he was out of the Marines for some time. I don't know the exact chronology, but he ended up teaching at the University of Northern Iowa before I did. Oh, wow. And he, at one point in time, decided to sell it, and he came in for a lesson with Jacobs, and Jacobs bought it. And so I come down to a lesson, and I see two of these tubas down there. And I asked Jacobs, what's up with it? And he says, well, I, I bought this other one from Ron Munson. And, uh, well, I'm not sure which one is better. And so he was mulling over trying to pick the best one, the original or this one. And mm -hmm. he liked them both, and he wow. let me play on them. And he told me he would paid $1,000 to Ron for it. And then I think he forgot he told me that. So I started bugging him about once a week or in between lessons. I would just call him up and try to be really friendly and ask him if he'd made a decision. And I was down in a, oh, Palos Heights or Palos Hills south southwest of Chicago doing some private teaching at a Sandberg High School. And I remember calling him up about 5 o'clock from the band phone because we didn't have cell phones, of course, in those days. And I asked him if he made up his mind after we'd had a little conversation first. And he says, all right, just come on over and pick it up, but I need to have a check. It's going to cost $1,100. you got to know I'm making $100 on it. And I said, no problem, Mr. Jacobs. So after I was done teaching that day, I drove straight to 8839 South Normal Avenue and wrote out a check and took that tuba home. And except for five years, I've owned it all my life for about the last 40-some years. There was a, about a five-year period where I mistakenly sold it to Floyd Cooley, and he used it with the San Francisco Symphony uh, for some time, I think some concerts and some recordings, and then uh, eventually he let go of it, and Tony Clements had it, and I bought it back from Tony. Biggest mistake I ever made in my life was to sell it, mm -hmm. and so I, I've used this uh, pretty much my whole career here at North Texas. I've played the whole ring cycle on it. With, wow the Dallas Opera, and uh, conductor liked it. After the ring cycle, we did a Tchaikovsky opera later in that season, and it only had a few notes in it. I, I can't remember what it was. Uh, there's only a couple of Tchaikovsky operas that are not done for that much. Mm -hmm. So I brought in uh, another tuba that was easier to carry that was a little bit smaller, and it was kind of nice and shiny. and. During the break, the music director, Graham Jenkins from England, he calls me up and he says, Don, that's a very nice tuba that you have there. Huh? Very nice. Gets a good sound. But we must have the big one. <laughs> <laughs> so I was back to uh, lugging this around and bringing it down for the Tchaikovsky opera. But it told me that the conductor was really listening. How about that? So yeah. uh, I've loved Deep ears, that's good. Yeah, I don't. I don't know what I'll do with this tuba now. I still. I still play it a little bit. Uh, it's in really pretty good playing condition. Maybe only a slight amount of leakage in the valves. Uh, I've done a little bit of minor restoration with it, and uh, sometimes I think about leaving it to the Dallas Opera. I'm not sure. <laughs>